to talk in the next two lectures about the contents of the lecture notes that are in chapter five. Okay, so if you want to follow the the contents of the notes, all, all of these is it will be like chapter five. Actually, the topic of these two lectures will be uh, not independent, but uh, I mean. I will start from the very beginning considering a different homogeneous manifold from the ones we have considered up to now. So if you got lost at some point in my previous lectures, then okay, this is a good point to, to catch back. <laughs> okay, so let me recall, first of all, uh, what we said at the very beginning of, of the conference, is what Benoit said on his first conference. If we consider a simply connected homogeneous Riemannian 3 manifold, then one has a good control on the dimension of, the, of its isometry group. So either the isometry group is six dimensional, five is impossible, and so you have four or three. You cannot have less than three dimensions in its isometry group. And moreover, you have uh, a, a classification of the spaces in these conditions. In the case that the dimension exists, you have a space of constant curvature, uh, I mean, uh, one of the space forms, the sphere, uh, Euclidean space or hyperbolic space, in the case that you have dimension four, you are working on one of these E3 kappa tau that we have been uh, for developing the theory during all these lectures, the Heisenberg, it's to cross R, it's to cross R, PSL2R, and Berger spheres. And finally, in the case that you have uh, a, a group of isometries of dimension three, then the classification, the, the resulting uh, manifolds can be classified, but the classification is much more technical, you have much, much more cases, but in any case, all of them are Lie groups uh, having left invariant metrics. Okay. So, uh, and this is related to the Thurston three-dimensional geometries. If you recall what uh, Benoit said, the Thurston three-dimensional geometries are homogeneous structures modeled on Riemannian three-manifolds, simply connected, uh, such that, um, well, they have basically two, con two, con two properties. One is that they admit compact quotients, and the other one is that their isometry group is maximal. Okay? So under these conditions, you have an exact classification of, of eight different thur Thurston geometries. The first three Thurston geometries are the three model spaces, the three canonical spaces. In the, uh, afterwards, you have uh, four of these uh, elements, E3 kappa tau, H2 cross R, H2 cross R, Heisenberg space, and the universal covering of PSL2R. And here, Berger spheres are missing because their isometry group is not maximal. It is containing the isometry group of the three-dimensional sphere. And finally, you have, for the case of dimension three, among all of these different Lie groups with left invariant metrics, you have one special, which is the group Sol3. Okay, it has compact quotients and, and a maximal group of uh, isometries. So uh, we have developed, uh, uh, and the theory of CMC surfaces is classically developed here, okay? So in, this, in these spaces. And we have developed the theory in all those lectures and the remaining ones uh, that are to be uh, given tomorrow in all these spaces. So the natural question is what happens with this, okay? What is the geometry of CMC surfaces in the three-dimensional space Sol3? So as I have uh, previously talked basically about, uh, well, existence a uniqueness of constant mean curvature spheres, for instance, in the first lecture. So it is natural here the, to uh, expose the following two problems. One is the problem of Alexandrov, which will consist on classifying all compact embedded CMC surfaces in Sol3, and the other one, the Hof problem, to classify all immersed CMC spheres, topological spheres in Sol3. Okay, so how can, how can we do this? The first guess that one does is saying, okay, in the case of uh, space forms, we had the Hopf differential. L l let me talk about the Hopf, Hopf problem at first, okay, the Alexandrov problem. Uh, in this case, it is easy from the, topological, from the topological point of view, and I will explain it afterwards. Let me talk about the Hopf problem. How did we solve the Hopf problem in space forms? It happened that the Hopf differential was holomorphic, so uh, that should vanish on a sphere, and we can classify the points vanishing of the sphere, saying that they are umbilical, so the, the surface is totally umbilical and has a rhombus, and therefore a round sphere. In the case where we had one of these E3 kappa tau, there was uh, something called the Abel Rosenberg differential, which is also holomorphic, and you can do more or less the same stuff, and you end up knowing that the sphere is rotational invariant. Okay, so the problem is, can we do more or less the same thing here in Sol? This is the first natural question that one has for this space. Well, 
it turns out that there are many difficulties uh, for doing this. The first one is that you don't have in Sol 3 continuous families of rotations. In some sense, uh, the spaces we started with have a four-dimensional isometry group, and Sol 3 only has a three-dimensional isometry group. So uh, the three isometries of Sol 3 will be like translations. So we are losing rotations. Okay? In some sense, we don't have a one-parameter family of isometries of the space whose orbits are compact. Okay? So if we do try to classify the CMC surfaces which are invariant by these continuous families of isometries of the ambient space, none of them will have compa uh, compact orbits. So it is absolutely impossible to have rotational constant mean curvature sphere. This is very bad in some sense because uh, the most natural way to construct a CMC surface, the most easy way, is to take a rotational example and, tr and see what happens. The PDE transforms into an ordinary differential equation and you can deal with it. Here, you cannot do it because you don't have these rotations. Okay, still you can try to say, okay, I don't have rotations, but I'm going to try to find out uh, what is the geometry. I'm, I would try to find out some sort of uh, CMC sphere by other methods. Well, it turns out also that the explicit computations in Sol 3 are very difficult. Okay, so up to now, uh, there are no known constant mean curvature spheres like explicit. I cannot put the equation of a constant mean curvature sphere. And there are not even known uh, how to construct a holomorphic differential. So in this sense, the Abrams-Rosenberg technique or the Hopf technique does not work in the sense that you don't have anything holomorphic. And for instance, uh, even if you want to compute the geodesics of Sol, um, they cannot be computed explicitly in general, only in certain directions. So Sol 3, uh, although it is a simple space in the, in the sense of, it defini of its definition that I will explain pre uh, in some moments, uh, in order to compute things there, you have problems. Okay, so these, the two basic things that we had for the other cases, none of them hold. So one could actually think, okay, but are there constant mean curvature spheres? Okay, if there are not, then we, it, is not, not, it doesn't make sense to propose these problems. Well, it turns out that there are actually constant mean curvature spheres with moreover are embedded. Why is this? Well, this is so because, the, uh, as I said, Sol 3 has a, is a homogeneous manifold with a compact quotient. And in these conditions, the general theory of the isoperimetric problem tells you that for e every volume that you prescribe, you have a solution to the isoperimetric problem. So there are, isoperimetric solution, uh, there are solutions to the isoperimetric problem. And also the general theory of the isoperimetric problem tells you that they are compact, embedded, constant mean curvature surfaces. And one can prove that, for instance, for uh, very, very, very small volumes, they are round spheres, they are uh, topological spheres. So, indeed, you have embedded constant mean curvature spheres. So, it makes sense to classify the, the, this type of surfaces, and it make this very, makes it very desirable because of the relation also with the superimetric problem. Okay, but even though we know that there are embedded CMC spheres, what we don't know is the existence of a constant mean curvature sphere for a given value of the mean curvature. Imagine that I give you the value h equal to 100, for instance. Okay, you know that there are constant mean curvature spheres, but you don't know if for that specific value you have one or not. Even I say 100, I say 20 million. h equal to 20 million, we don't know if it exists or not. Okay, so this is the type of problems that appear here, and these are the type of problems that we are going to solve um, as far as we know. Okay. So the basic result that I'm going to expose in these two lectures is a result obtained jointly with, with Benoit, which uh, states the following. I'm going first to uh, well, I'm going to, to explain the, the result because maybe it has it's quite long. Assume that you are given a value for the mean curvature, I mean a certain constant, which is greater than this uh, funny constant that we have here that I will explain afterwards where it comes from. Then we have uh, assertions regarding existence and uniqueness. First, uh, regarding existence, we, sh we will prove that there exists a constant mean curvature sphere having as mean curvature the value we specified at the very beginning and that is embedded and moreover it has index one. Okay? So what does index one mean? For, I mean, for uh, uh, surface, constant mean curvature surfaces in a general Riemannian T manifold, you can define what is called le, the Jacobi operator, which is given by this expression, uh, I use here B. Uh, 
Okay? So this is the Laplacian of the induced metric, this is the norm, the square norm of the second fundamental form, and this is the Ricci tensor of the ambient space acting on the unit normal of the surface. So this is called the Jacobi operator. So if we consider the the well the operator given by minus the Jacobi operator, then this operator it can be proved by elliptic theory that it has a sequence, a discrete sequence of uh, of eigenvalues. It's increasing. The first one is always simple, and you have an increasing sequence of I want, I, of eigenvalues for this operator. Okay, so the index is the number of negative eigenvalues. Okay. So, uh, in the case that we have a constant, this is very general for any for any Riemannian three manifold, and the index can be a lot of numbers. It can be zero in some cases. Okay. But for the case that we are working in Sol three, it turns out that uh, well, I will explain it maybe in the next lecture that the index cannot be equal to zero. The least uh, possible, I mean, uh, yeah, the smallest possible number that the index can have is one. So what we are seeing here is that the, in the systems part that these spheres have index one. Geometrically, having index one means something very simple, and is that if you have the sphere and you want to perturb it to make some local deformation of it, such that the mean you in order to obtain another constant mean curvature sphere with the same mean curvature, then the only way of doing is of doing it is by rigidly translating the the sphere you had with. Okay, you don't have any other type of deformation. This is more or less what is saying index one. So it is a question of local uniqueness. What is telling you here index one? And moreover, well, it tells you another thing, but I'm not going to enter now. So and we have like two different uh, assertions regarding uniqueness. First, it turns out that any constant mean curvature sphere in Sol three is congruent to this embedded sphere. So this is a result of Hopf type uniqueness. Okay. And the, this sphere is also unique in the Alexandrov sense. That is, any other compact embedded constant mean curvature surface in Sol with this specific value of the mean curvature is congruent to the, to the sphere given by the first part. And actually, for these two uh, second assertions regarding the uniqueness, uh, the uniqueness holds, moreover, whenever we have, uh, for that specific value of the, mean constant, of the constant mean curvature, a, an index one sphere. Okay, in, in case we have an index one sphere, like for instance an isoperimetric sphere, then the both type of uniqueness hold because also this sphere should be actually embedded. We can prove that it is embedded. So, uh, okay. So the problem here, uh, the only thing that would remain is to get uh, a better existence result. Okay, uh, in the in the following sense, we conjecture that this family that we only know that there exists. For h, for every h greater than one over square root of three, actually can be extended to every value of the mean curvature. So in some sense, what we are saying is that it is our guess that in Sol three, uh, you have a situation similar with what happens in R three. What happens in R three? In R three, the only um, compact embedded CMC surfaces and the only uh, compact immersed um, uh, CMC spheres are the round spheres, and they form. A uh, real analytic family, depending on the radius, and all of them are exactly the isoperimetric regions of the of R3. We believe that this is true, actually in Sol3. Okay, so the conjecture is like this: the specific value here over square root of three comes from a certain argument we have to use at a certain point of the proof, coming from uh, well, from a different well, from stability from a stability inequality due to Harold Rosenberg. Uh, but it is our feeling that this is not as essential value in Sol 3 and that you should actually try to, uh, it would be possible uh, actually to go to the to every value greater than zero. Okay, so what's the plan? In this first lecture, I'm going to explain, well, the, the basics of the geometry of Sol 3. I'm going to explain what is this space and how it works. And uh, I'm going to work with surface, uh, to, well, surfaces in, of constant mean curvature in Sol 3, and we are going to uh, describe them in terms of their Gauss map. 
we are going to see that the Lie group Gauss map, as Benoit defined in his previous lecture in the case of Heisenberg space, also makes sense in this setting and it can be used to describe constant mean curvature surfaces in Sol 3. And in the, mm, in the next uh, lecture tomorrow, I will explain both the uniqueness and the existence of constant mean curvature spheres. What I, would do is, uh, what I will do is the following thing. We will first prove a certain uh, beta version, a certain uh, unfinished version for the uniqueness of constant mean curvature spheres. We will prove that constant mean curvature spheres are unique both in the Hof and Alexandrov senses whenever we have an index one CMC sphere. For that, what we will do is to construct a certain quadratic differential in terms of this index one sphere whose existence is assumed by, by hypothesis in and for that we will use the Gauss map. But this is uh, uh, also a quite uh, different situation than the case of other homogeneous bundles, mainly because uh, in other homogeneous spaces the average Rosenberg differential was something holomorphic, but here the quadratic differential we construct is not holomorphic. And the average Rosenberg differential also had a very explicit uh, uh, expression, while the, ho uh, the quadratic differential we are going to construct is not explicit. Okay, this is, this is the problems that one has because, well, in Sol 3, as I said previously, uh, it seems a less uh, explicit space than the other and computations are much more complicated. And finally, we will prove the existence of constant mean curvature spheres, the existence part. First, we will prove that in index one uh, spheres are embedded and we will show that index one spheres can be locally deformed. And finally, in order, so what happens is that you have an index one sphere, you start deforming it and you have uh, an analytic family of spheres. But you can lose the property of being a sphere in the case that the surface, that this uh, analytic family of spheres uh, goes to infinity in some way and so in the limit by taking an adequate subsequence it can converge to something which is not a sphere. Okay? So uh, to prevent this we need a, a diameter estimate which implies that spheres keep being spheres. Okay? For that, but unfortunately this diameter estimate is only valid when the mean curvature is greater than 1 over square root of 3. So this is the very spe special case, the very, uh, this final estimate is the only reason why this funny constant appears and why the, the method that we use doesn't work for all values. Okay? If one obtains a better diameter estimate, one obtains the, the whole process works and one obtains the whole solution to the problem we were looking for. Okay, uh, so let me start talking about the geometry of the homogeneous space all three. Okay. This homogeneous space um, well, has a quite nice description in coordinates, very simple to, to understand, which is the following thing. You see it, Sol 3, as the usual space R3, end out with this Riemannian metric that you have here. Exponential 2 times x3 dx1 squared plus exponential minus 2 times x3 dx2 squared plus dx3 squared. Okay. So what happens to this space? Um, okay, I want to understand first what are the isometries of the space. There are two very clear iso isometries. One is like if you have only here dx1 square, if you put instead of x1, x1 plus a constant, you end up having an, the same metric, so that's an isometry. The same with x2. So this means that translations in the direction of the x1 axis and the direction of the x2 axis are isometries of the space. What happens with a direction in the x3 axis? If you put x3 plus a constant here, then you have this funny coefficient here that change. Okay? But as this is x3 plus a constant, it's like a constant comes out when you do this, and so you only need to, to make a small dil uh, well, a certain dilation here on x1, on x1 and a certain dilation here on x2 in order to make the metric to be invariant again. So. Uh, basically, uh, you have the, these three parameters of families of isometries. Translations in the x1 direction, translation in, in the x2 direction, and translation in the x3 direction, direction uh, but composed also with certain dilation of, of, of some ad adequate coefficients in the first two uh, coordinates. Now you can compute the associated killing fields that you have that Sol3 has three linearly independent killing fields, which are these ones. These two are the usual partial derivatives, and you have a third, more complicated killing field uh, that you can see here. Okay, so the basic, um, as we already have dimension three, 
Uh, um, we know that Sol3 is a homogeneous space of dimension 3, and we already have a three-parameter family of, of isometries, so there cannot be too much isometries missing here. Okay? But it turns out, and this is very important because it contrasts, for instance, with the case of Heisenberg space, that in Sol3 you can have symmetries that reverse the orientation of the space. So you can have symmetries. Or, I mean, not just isometries, but like reflections. Okay? So. One of them is simply uh, changing, oh, you can see it very clear from here. If you change x1 by minus x, x1, this doesn't change. So this is a, a, an isometry of the space. And the same with x2. Okay? So at least you have two different of these uh, reflections in, the, in Sol3. But it turns out that there are, well, some more. The, the group uh, that, uh, that leaves the origin variant is generated by these two elements. You have here a reflection. In the, with respect to the plane x1 equal to constant, well, to zero in that case, and you have this uh, funny um, isometry, which is just you take the first two coordinates and you rotate them uh, 90 degrees, and then you take the x3 and you put it down. So it's a, well, a rotation here and a, um, a symmetry in the other plane. So there are t these are two reversing isometries. And for instance, the other clear one that you have, which is reflection with respect to x2 equals 0, you can obtain them by a certain composition of the other two. These two uh, isometries generate the whole space of, of uh, well, the isotropy, uh, I mean, the, well, the space of uh, isometries of, of, of Sol3 that leave the origin invariant. So it turns out that all the isometries of Sol3 are obtained by composing these these basic ones, this orientation reversing and the three parameter group of isometries previously. Okay, so um, from the point of view of isometries of Sol3, we know all that we need at first, but it turns out now that you have two very canonical, two very important uh, canonical foliations that we call, which are the foliations given by the planes x1 equal to constant, so something like this. And also the planes, um, I don't know how to draw them. Mm. Well, I'll draw the, the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, the planes x2 equal to constant, so maybe I can do it like this. Okay. Okay, so you have x1 equal to constant on one hand, on the one side, and on the other side, uh, uh, on the other side, x2 equals to constant. Okay, so um, these two, uh, what are the properties of these foliations? Well, we know that they are orthogonal to these killing fields because these killing fields were just partial x1 and partial x2. So you have that they are orthogonal to that killing fields, and moreover, you can prove by, uh, well that the leaves are totally geodesic. So each plane, like x1 equal to constant or x2 equal to constant, is a totally geodesic plane. In particular, it is minimal. Okay. So uh, we can actually reflect isometrically the, the whole soul about them. So they, are, they act as a one-parameter family of planes of reflection symmetry in the whole space. And you have it in two directions, in the x1 direction and in the x2 direction. Okay? And moreover, one can prove that any of these is isometric to the hyperbolic uh, plane. That is to say, if you take the induced metric of one of those planes, what you have is the induced metric of the hyperbolic plane. This is very simple to see, and is that if you consider the metric of Sol3, okay, so imagine, for instance, that x2 is, co is constant. We are working on the Fourier x2 equal constant. So this goes, and we have this metric. But this metric is actually the metric of the hyperbolic plane in what is called horospherical coordinates. Okay. And by making a change of variable, you can uh, make these coordinates to become the, the usual coordinates of the half plane, uh, Poincare, the, ha the Poincare half plane. Okay, so it turns out that intrinsically, uh, well, and you can do the same with, with, I mean, if you quit here uh, ex uh, this part, 
then this metric that you have here is also horospherical coordinates. So it turns out that all the, the planes, x1 equal to constant and x2 equal to constant, from an intrinsic point of view, are hyperbolic planes. Okay, so this has a very interesting application regarding constant mean curvature uh, surfaces. If you recall, uh, the, one of the basic theorems of the theory was the Alexandrov theorem that said that if you have something compact and embedded of constant mean curvature, then it's a, a round sphere. How, and the way to prove this was to use the Alexandrov reflection principle, which in turn implied that the surface was a big a bigraph. Okay, so it's, uh, it has a, pl a plane of symmetry, and before that plane and after that plane, the surface is a graph with respect to the plane with which with to re with respect to which it, it is symmetric. Okay, so here we have that as we have two different families of um, of uh, reflection planes, we can work in the same lines and get a result which says that uh, that which solves the Alexandrov problem from the uh, from the topological point of view it says that if you have any compact embedded constant mean curvature surface in sol 3 then uh, its topology is the topology of a sphere it has genus 0 why is this well you have the surface li like this you don't know how i mean it could have some genus you don't know how it is but then you take the one of the family of planes x1 equal to constant and you start doing the Alexander reflection principle in that direction. Then what you end up having is uh, that the surface cannot be of any shape, but it has to be of a very special shape, which is that you have a plane here, maybe with some, um, maybe with some holes, you have here, cert here certain domain, and the surface should be symmetric with respect to that domain and a graph. So you could, you could still have, well, I mean, you could still have some holes like there. For instance, you can imagine, it is very simple to see it if you see a torus, okay? Imagine that you have a torus and you start trying to do Alexander reflection principle just from the upper part, okay? So you will end up having like, uh, well, a reflection plane, which this torus has it, so there's no contradiction, and, the, and it will be a bigraph over something, some domain, which is actually an annulus. So this is not giving any contradiction. But now we can do the same, pr the same uh, method going now in the perpendicular direction, because we do also have um, well, reflection planes in that direction. And we, when do we do that, it turns out that this domain, that could be very, very complicated, is actually also uh, a graph a bigraph, okay? So it turns out that in the end that the domain is simply connected and so you have a bigraph, I mean that is a graph uh, in the upper part and a graph in the lower part in, um, defined on a simply connected domain. So that means that the surface is topologically a sphere. So this is very interesting for our purposes because it tells you that if you are to work with embedded uh, CMC surfaces and to classify them, you can restrict to the Hof problem. In some sense, the Alexandrov problem is reduced to the Hof problem and to study the embeddedness of the examples. Okay, so this is the, the key point that, the, that the, well, this basic uh, argument by Rosenberg tells. Okay, it turns out, apart from that, that there are other foliations which well, are less important but which are st still interesting. Well, the first foliation is the one composed by uh, horizontal planes. So in Sol 3, you can make the, the foliation of horizontal planes. And, well, and it turns out that they, are, uh, they have still good properties. If you see them from an intrinsic point of view, they are flat, so they are isometric to R2, and they have zero mean curvature, they are minimal. But uh, they are not reflection planes anymore. So if you reflect, I mean, you cannot reflect about this because in Sol it doesn't ma have any sense reflecting about this, okay? Doesn't have good properties. And moreover, they are not, you don't have like a killing field here that is um, orthogonal to all, the, to, all the, um, to all these leaves. So this vibration, although it is interesting to know its existence, maybe it doesn't give so much information. And the other type of, of foliations which are interesting are the following ones that I put here. X1 equals a constant exponential minus X3 plus another constant B, and this is another one. 
So, how do these foliations work? I take A. I take A to be uh, fixed. Okay. If you have A to be fixed, and I, I draw just the picture in one dimension, then this foliation, for instance, an element of this foliation for a certain fixed A, would be like a curve like this, and its family of translations. So you have well, something like this, okay? This, for every value of the mean curve of, the, of this constant A, provides a foliation of the whole space. And this is interesting because mm, uh, this, uh, this type of, of surfaces have the following property. They are just uh, the parallel translation uh, of a, at a constant distance of one of the total geodesic samples. That is to say, I could take the total geodesic plane like this in Sol 3, like for instance S1 equal to 0, and I want to understand what are, I mean, so this has a unit normal, and so I move in the direction of the unit normal of, the, of this leaf at a constant di distance. Okay, so it's the usual definition that we have, for instance, in R3. You take the unit normal and you make the parallel surface at a constant distance. Well, it turns out that the surface you obtain is one of those, one of those examples. I don't know how to put them. They are something like this, maybe. I don't know if I put it the other way around after, before, but they are here like Euclidean Lee. They're, they look like asymptotic, and this is the parallel surface. So this is one of the elements of the of the foliation given by a parallel translation, and they are separated by a certain distance d, which depends only on the on the constant uh, a that you have here. Again, you can prove that the leaves are minimal, but they are not totally geodesic, and they not have any other good property. But but still, it is important that uh, even though we don't know the geodesics in Sol 3 explicitly or things like that, it, 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 it is very, as this foliation is very important, it is also very important to know what are the, the, the surfaces which are at a constant distance of one of the elements of the total geodesic family. Okay, and the other thing important about Sol 3 that we will use is that it is a Lie group. Well, I mean, existence, you know, you know it in general. The problem is to compute them explicitly. And it turns out that Sol 3 <coughs> So imagine you have a point in Sol 3, and you consider, like the origin, for instance, and you consider the sphere around of all possible uh, initial values for the, for the equation of um, of uh, geodesics. Then it turns out that this direction you know, and all the directions horizontal, you know them also explicitly how they work, the geodesics. Okay? But if you take a uh, skew direction like this, then the ordinary differential equation that you have uh, is not. Uh, well, uh, many, some people have tried to find out a uh, first integral for that or trying to, to guess the shape, but they, they didn't succeed. So, I mean, this uh, the six here, you know, this here, you know, but the, the rest, you don't know them. But the, well. Okay. So, uh, the other thing is that uh, SOL3 has a Lie group structure like all the other, well, like most of the other homogeneous spaces. Uh, the Lie group structure is the one given here. Okay, you so have you have two points of a, uh, of R three, like in so, and you put this new uh, coordinate of of R three. So it turns out that the metric, the Riemannian metric of Sol three, is left invariant for this Lie group structure. This allows you to use a globally uh, or left invariant orthonormal frame of the space, which is given in that case by these three vectors. So it's x1, x2, x3, but in these two coordinates you put a, some co exponential co uh, coefficient. So this is exactly what Benoit did on his first talk. Okay? He, he constructed, in the case of Heisenberg, 
a canonical frame, which was a left invariant orthonormal frame for the Lie group structure of Heisenberg. So I'm doing here the same of Sol 3. Now, once you have this, this uh, canonical frame, you can compute the, the curvature of Sol 3. It turns out that if you consider, you have like, um, like three different planes, you can consider like the plane given by E1 and E2, the plane given by E2 and E3, and the one given by E2, E3. So on each, on each one of those planes, you can compute the sectional curvature. It turns out that this sectional curvature is minus one, this sectional curvature is minus one, but this sectional curvature is one. Okay. So you have a sign uh, change here, and if you compute the Ricci curvature, you end up having this eigenvalue, zero, zero, and minus two. In particular, uh, Sol3 has a constant scalar curvature, well, minus two or minus the, the constant that you want to put, depending on the definition of scalar curvature that, that you use. Okay, so this is, these are basically the, well, the uh, very mm, quiet uh, description of Sol3. Uh, it turns out that, well, as, as you can see, the, the description of Sol3 is quite simple. It doesn't have very complicated uh, geometrical objects behind, but also because of the lack of properties that it has, it is more, more difficult to work sometimes with surface theory inside. Okay. So I'm going to work now, uh, start working with constant mean curvature surfaces in Sol3. I'm going to work with the Gauss map. So the idea is the following thing. If you remember, in the case that we have a surface immersed into one of these homogeneous three-dimensional spaces, E3 kappa tau, then uh, Benoit was able to construct uh, a set of necessary and sufficient conditions for integrability of the surface. And for that, and the, the set of conditions, even though it was not too simple, but it was um, good enough in the sense that as the base is homogeneous, um, okay, you have some structure there, and so you have only to take uh, care of what goes in the vertical direction and what goes in the horizontal direction. But in the case of Sol3, this is not like this, because in some sense, uh, okay, the, the first two coordinates are more or less the same, but they are not, you, the, you, you don't have a homogeneous structure there. So in some sense, you need to, to be taking care of the three coordinates of the space in order to do the computations. And this is very inconvenient for making computations. So the idea here is to use, uh, to describe integrability of surfaces in Sol3 using a single object, which in this case will be the Gauss map of the surface. So let me define this. Uh, Benoit already defined it in his previous talk. I'm going to do it uh, again for this case of, of Sol3. So assume that you have, well, I have here CMCH, it can be any surface, okay? You have a surface in Sol3, and you take its unit normal, and its unit normal is a vector field in the space, so you, as you have a globally defined left in, uh, frame, E1, E2, E3, you can also put, always put it like this. And so what you do is to make the stereographic projection of these three coordinates. So you end up having a map from the surface, from the parameter domain of the surface, into the Riemann sphere. What you are doing is basically you take the unit normal and you left translate it to the to the origin and so it takes values in the Lie algebra on the unit Lie, in the Lie algebra of of the Lie group which is identified with with the Riemann sphere. This is the this is the idea and this is actually what you, one usually does with the Gauss map of, of R3. Different points are always taken to the origin in order to to have them defined on just one sphere and not on, on a sphere on its tangent plane. That's the idea. So what we are going to do is to to well, to show that the Gauss map satisfies a certain second order elliptic partial differential equation, and that moreover uh, the Gauss map determines the surface. So uh, in some sense, uh, if we start working with the Gauss map, uh, we don't lose information, okay? Because the Gauss map determines the surface uniquely by means of a certain integral formula. This is based on, on something that Kenmotsu did many, did many years ago in the case of R3. Kenmotsu proved that if you have a constant mean curvature surface in, in R3 and you take the conformal structure of its first fundamental form, then its Gauss map is a harmonic map. Well, this might be previously known. And uh, actually, you can reconstruct the surface in terms of the, of the Gauss map. Okay? So in this case, case we are trying to do a uh, well, computation similar but it will turn out that the Gauss map will not be harmonic, will satisfy a certain equation that I'm going to put here. 
so this is a bit different, but uh, the, the fact that the Gauss map determines the surface by integral formula will still hold. Okay, so what is the what is the equation for the Gauss map? Well, it's the following thing that you have here. Assume that you have G to be the Gauss map of some surface in Sol 3 whose mean curvature is H for a specific value of the mean curvature. Then it satisfies this differential equation here. G set set bar equals a certain function A, G set, G set bar, plus a certain function B, G well, this is the modulus of, of G set bar square. Okay. What are A and B? A and B are rational functions. Imagine that you have R defined by this expression. Okay, so it's a polynomial in the variables w, uh, w and W bar. And so you compute this, der this derivative here and you do this expression here. So you end up having A and B defined by that expression as rational functions of, of W. So what you need to put here in the equation is just substitute w by, by G. Okay, so uh, what is this equation telling? This equation telling is telling the following thing. Imagine that you have b equals zero. Okay, so you have this equation where you have this only this a, where r is something positive. Okay, I don't need to be like this, just something positive. So I write, I write here. I took the. <laughs> I have four of them in this place, and none is the other one. <laughs> so imagine you have an equation like this. Well, here r is a function depending on q, which is positive. Okay, then this is the harmonic map equation for a certain Riemannian metric on the sphere. Okay, this is the harmonic map equation. For some Riemannian metric on the Riemann sphere theorem. The Riemannian metric can be read in terms of this uh, function r. I don't know it by heart, but it can be easily se seen what is the, 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 the Riemannian function in terms of, of this function r. So in the case that in this Gauss map equation only that coefficient appeared, we, will have, we would have that the Gauss map is harmonic for some metric. Okay? This is what happens, for instance, for minimal surfaces in Heisenberg, that you only have an expression like this and so the Gauss map is harmonic with respect to a metric that turns out to be the metric of the Poincaré disk. This is what Benoit did in his first lecture, in, well, in, his, in his lecture today. But in our case, this is not the case, because B in general is different from zero. Okay? So it is not an equation of a harmonic map. It is rather some sort of generalized harmonic map equation and up to now, we don't know if it has a clear geometric interpretation, for instance, a solution, as a solution of some variational problem, like um, obtained by perturbing the, the harmonic, the usual variational problem in terms of the energy that provides as critical points the harmonic maps. Okay? I find may maybe this is likely, but we don't know if it, if it can happen. Okay, so uh, we know that, this, the, that the Gauss map satisfies this equation, and it turns out that you can also go in the other way. And you can prove that any uh, map from a Riemann surface, simply connected Riemann surface, into the into the Riemann sphere, satisfying this equation, and, and that it is uh, nowhere anti-holomorphic, that is that G set is also diff is always different from zero, then any map under these conditions is the Gauss map of some constant mean curvature sphere uh, surface whose value for the mean curvature is the the H that appears. In the, in the description of A and B here. Okay. And moreover, if you, you can recover the surface in terms, the immersion in terms of the Gauss map. Okay, so this surface can be recovered by this expression. What, how does this expression work? You have a very clear expression here for the third coordinate, and in the, f and in the first two coordinates, you have to put the value you obtained here for the first coordinate, like an exponential, and, this, and the rest of things are in terms of the Gauss map. So, uh, 
Okay, so th this is telling you that in order to work with constant mean curvature uh, surfaces in SOL3, it is good, a good idea to try to work just with the Gauss map because rather than having like three different coordinates that you have to arrange in some special way in order to make computations work, you, you can all only do this with the uh, Gauss map and it works. And it also has uh, an, int an interesting uh, application, which is the application regarding the case of minimal surfaces in SOL3. So what happens when we put in the previous equations h equal to zero? Then in that case, if h equal to zero, the we have this, that this coefficient b here vanishes. This vanishes if the mean curvature is zero. So we have this uh, harmonic map equation that, we put in, that I put here, and the, the equation is like this. So uh, as a corollary, uh, we obtain directly that uh, the Gauss map is harmonic with respect to a certain uh, strange metric. Okay? The strange metric that we have here is this one. How is this metric on the sphere? It is not a Riemannian metric, okay? in the sense that it is not globally defined on the whole sphere. It is singular when uh, g is plus or minus g bar. So, if I have here the complex plane C, the metric is singular here and singular here. So in some sense, we have uh, well some problems. The, the, if the Gauss map is defined in one of these regions, then it is a harmonic Gauss map. But if not, uh, then uh, well you have singularities. It is more or less the same that what happened with the equation of minimal surfaces in Heisenberg. For minimal surfaces in Heisenberg. Benoit showed that it is harmonic with respect to a Poincaré metric here. It can be made harmonic with respect to a Poincaré metric here by just reflecting, but you have problems exactly on the on the boundary. Okay, so this is the same, but the boundary are two two lines. And also, as a, a direct consequence of the Gauss map equation, what we have is that all minimal surfaces in Sol three have a holomorphic quadratic differential. Okay, so we don't know. If there exists a holomorphic quadratic differential for constant mean curvature surfaces in SOL3, and we don't know. Do you have this even, even though the other thing is you don't have the harmonic map? Sorry? We, we have this Q no matter, even if you don't have the, the metric. Yes, yes, in the, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to explain this now. Okay, so. Uh, Okay, you, you don't know if there, are, if there is something holomorphic for values of the mean curvature different from zero. But in the case that the mean curvature is zero, you have something holomorphic which is given in terms of the Gauss map of the minimal surface by this expression. Okay, so you have that this expression here could have some problems here, like with when uh, g squared minus g bar squared equals zero, that is, in those two cases, you could have some problem. But it turns out that you don't have them because the function g set divided by g squared minus g bar squared is, uh, is always well defined. Okay, This thing is always well defined. You, one can prove that this thing is well defined for any minimal surface. So uh, this is what we have here and this is something mm, finite. So uh, we have that this is well defined. It could be not well defined at, at the infinity but then we can use this funny uh, isometry that I told about Sol that you can reverse the space, and, and using this you can you can show that it is actually well defined also at infinity. So it turns out that minimal surfaces in Sol three have a holomorphic quadratic differential, and this is interesting because uh, it completes a bit the well what is known for the rest of spaces in the following sense. Okay, you have R3, S3, H3, which are the three canonical uh, space forms, and, and you have, let us consider H equal to zero, minimal surfaces, okay? So for the case of minimal surfaces in R3, you have that the Gauss map is meromorphic. For the case of H3, you have that the Gauss map uh, viewed as uh, essentially as the Hopf projection of the usual unit normal here, is uh, also harmonic into S2. And for the case of H3, the Lie group Gauss map is harmonic into, I'm going to put something. 
Okay, something means uh, some two-dimensional metric uh, Riemannian with singularities defined on on the on the um, on the Riemann sphere C bar. This last result is a result by Kokubu. Okay, this is a result by Kokubu. This I don't know whose result it is. Very classical, and this all, uh, this is also a classical result. So, what happens for the rest of the cases? La cases like H2 cross R and S2 cross R. Heisenberg, Berger, and PSL2R. Well, it turns out that for these two cases, you, uh, as Logan explained, the, the projection is harmonic. Okay, it's harmonic into the base space, either H2 or S2. In Heisenberg, Benoit proved that G is harmonic into the Poincaré disk. And for this case of Berger spheres and PSL2R, we can prove also that G is harmonic for uh, something. In C bar, okay? This was proved by Lira. This is something, some silly computation that we made, uh, Benoit and Isabel and I. But simple. So it turns out that in all those geometries, you have something which is harmonic and which actually uh, recovers the its Hopf differential of uh, of the harmonic mass recovers the the Hopf differential of the ambient space that you have. Okay. So it turns out that in this picture, by this result, you can actually put also Sol three. Okay. So you have a whole complete picture here and the question would be for instance whether in all spa in other spaces in other homogeneous spaces different from Sol you can have also uh, some sort of harmonic uh, Gauss map uh, that will imply that you also have holomorphic quadratic differentials in all those spaces for the case of minimal in some of the cases the, this Gauss map is not the, w the good one but okay so this is open so uh, how much time Miyuki how much time do we have Five minutes. Mm. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to start the, the the part of spheres. I'm going just to say that there is uh, some uh, interesting. I mean, the, the theory of minimal surfaces in in Sol three seems to be uh, quite uh, interesting because of this you have this holomorphic differential you have something which is harmonic and so for instance you can try to construct examples using the, the harmonic map equation okay this is something that uh, that that is interesting so I think that the minimal surface theory in Sol 3 is a rich theory that one can use and in particular one can ask about the Bernstein problem in Sol 3. The Bernstein problem in Sol 3 asks for the classification of all entire uh, minimal graphs. When I say entire minimal graph, I would say entire with respect to one of those planes. Okay? You take one of the planes of the foliation and you want to, cl to understand how would more or less the, why it's the shape that some entire minimal graph can have like this. Okay? So it turns out that there are many, uh, well, we have computed some examples and, we, and there are like at least three or four families of entire minimal graphs in, in Sol 3. So it seems that you are going to have a, a wide variety of entire minimal graphs. So it seems an interesting question, since we have something holomorphic for this type of minimal surfaces and we have a harmonic Gauss map, to try to understand if they can be classified by uh, holomorphic differentials. Okay, so can one prove, for instance, that this holomorphic differential is induced on any entire graph and that you don't have any restriction, that any entire, I mean, that, that you have an if and only if condition, like in Heisenberg, that you have a correspondence between entire graphs, entire minimal graphs in Sol 3 and the case and, and the holomorphic quadratic differentials associated. Okay, in Heisenberg it was true. 
here uh, the result is is open so i think this is a, an interesting problem maybe uh, harder than, than the case of high number space so i think uh, i think i'm going to stop here and i will tell you tomorrow the the hardest part of the of the whole classification theorem i only wanted today to to show a bit what is the space in which we are going to to classify the the things okay thank you No, I, 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 I oh. sorry. Uh, the, the, the Alexander, I mean, I, 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 I can prove, well, I have proved that if you have a solution to the Alexander problem, like uh, compact embedded, uh, yeah. okay, if you have compact embedded, that then it is a sphere. So if I classify all constant mean curvature spheres and, and understand what, which of them are embedded, I am also classifying all compact embedded CMC surfaces because compact embedded CMC implies it has genus zero. So I can restrict to the case of genus zero. But regarding the, Alexandro, the, the isoperimetric problem, I only know that some of the spheres are isoperimetric regions. Yes. But this property could be, lost, co could be lost in the process. I mean, for instance, if you go to S2 cross R, well, imagine you have S2 cross R, then you can start with an isoperimetric sphere, and you start deforming it, and it loses stability. So it, can, it al al also loses the, the property of being isoperimetric. So we don't know if it is very unlikely that this happens here, but we don't know. Uh, sorry, I, I, mm, my statement was wrong. Uh, so if there yeah. exists an embedded CMC sphere, mm. uh, if, if you have a CMC sphere, then you, can, you don't need to do the assumption of H greater than. Yeah, exactly. If, yeah, but we, we need uh, a bit more than, than embedded. We need that it have index one. If, if you have some sphere for a certain value of the mean curvature, any value, you know that there exists for that value a CMC sphere which, have in, which has index one, then the sphere is embedded on the one hand, but on the other hand, uh, there are no more spheres for that value. Any other sphere that you have for that value is just a left translation of the sphere you, you knew it existed. Yes, we know existence of yeah. We know that the, that uh, index one embedded CMC spheres exist for every value uh, greater than one over the square root of three, and it is unique in all the senses. Yes, it is unique. Yeah, it is this sphere, and you don't have any other compact embedded surfaces for that value, and you don't have any other immersed spheres for that value. Okay. Yeah, but the existence we have existence we only have it. Okay, this is interesting. We only have. Uh, okay. So for which values do I know that there are CMC spheres? Okay. So this is zero, and this is the the value of the mean curvature. Okay. So we know that here, maybe starting from a certain undetermined moment, you have isoperimetric spheres. This is by the general solution to the superimetric problem. And we also know about some results by Pitet that you have here, for, very va for values very close to zero, you also have uh, solutions to the superimetric problem, which should be also constant mean curvature spheres. Okay, so the, the question is whether you can have it for all values. So what we have proved is that you have here 1 over square, uh, square root of 3. For all these values here, for each h, you have only one sphere. Yeah. Only one sphere for each h, which is unique among embedded also. And for all other cases, we know that for these values for which you know that some isoparametric sphere, it exists. If it exists, the isoparametric sphere, it is the unique CMC sphere that can exist there. For is it unique? Yes, unique. 
unique. We, we prove it is unique. We prove it is unique in the Hof sense and in the Alexandrov sense. Okay, so we prove it like this. But we need the the assumption of existence. Uh, you don't know the existence. We know the existence. We prove the existence in all of these. And if we and the problem the problem is that maybe the I mean we know existence like this, but it could happen that our spheres that could be something like that when the mean curvature goes close to some value, this value or of other value, start being greater and greater and greater. So in the end, you have some sort of cylinder maybe or, or something like this. And so in that, in that, in that way, you would lose existence uh, of, of, the, of your family of CMC spheres. But for that, we need the, to estimate the diameter. If we prove that the diameter of these spheres is uniformly bounded, then we can prove that this cannot happen. So you can still keep um, deforming the sphere. Are they all convex? No, I don't know. I don't know. They all have the, the their Gauss map is a global diffeomorphism. So they are convex in the sense of the Gauss map. The Gauss map is a, a diffeomorphism. It's injecting, absurdjective, and local diffeomorphism. It's a global diffeomorphism. Okay. So in the Euclidean sense, in some sense, they would be convex. I mean, in the nuclear case, it, it, they would be convex because the Gauss map is a diffeomorphism, so they, they are convex. Mm -hmm. But in that case, in this case, the relation between this Lie group Gauss map that involves translating things to the origin uh, is not uh, is not clear how to relate it with the geodesic convexity of the of the sphere. Yeah, I was thinking about how about the a kind of uh, concept of ambiguity. Um, the concept, of, well, yeah, I mean, means a point which is very close to the canonical solution of the isotope yes. between the four points. So at the point, hmm. the yeah, exactly. Um, assume that for a certain value, you have a sphere. Okay, for a certain value of the mean curvature, as, assume that you have a CMC H sphere. Okay. Uh, yeah, 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 just yeah, assume that you have for one value this, yeah. okay? So we are going to prove that there exists a certain differential for that value, let us call it QSH, and this, a zero, if this is P, you have that this thing would be zero at the point. So this is, there is, in some sense, once you know this, as the Gauss map is a global diffeomorphism, you have a notion of umbilic. In some, in some sense that we haven't uh, understood, we haven't studied it completely, but you would probably have a notion of umbilic.